All right. All right. Thank you, Adam. Good evening, everyone online here at the library. Welcome to April's Fairhaven Community Management Team. My name is Liz, co chair with Lee Poo. And just wanted to go over a quick, uh, quickly go over the house rules and uh, get everything started. So, we just want to run a focused, no fault problem solving. Uh, step forward, step back. So, if you'd like to maybe contribute a lot, maybe let some other people come forward and contribute as well as the conversation. We're going to make sure we offer an open, honest, safe space. Listen with open minds, believe in everyone's best intentions, be action oriented, decide what we want, when we want it, and plan for it to happen. And the Fair Haven Center collaboration. Uh, we're going to start, proceed, and end on time to honor our agenda. And we'll just go into some Zoom instructions quickly. So we want to make sure if just, just to make sure that there's no uh, additional chatter in the background to mute your microphones. If you're not speaking, use the chat box and the recording has started. We'll call the meeting to order and do our roll call, roll call on the board. And if you would like to introduce yourself, you may certainly use the chat, chat, chat box online and we'll check and see if anyone here in the room is here visiting with us for the first time and give a warm welcome to everyone. And uh, lastly, we'll go ahead and establish the quorum of our joining members. All right. So quickly, uh, we'll do the follow well, meeting to order officially um, for Thursday, April 6th and do a quick roll call of the board. Well, actually, actually, I'll do the roll call. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Liz? Here. Gina? Here. Abby? Here. Okay. Yep. Adam? Here. Lee? Present. And myself, Christina, present. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Christina. And just wanted to check in quickly. Is there anyone here visiting us either online uh, or here in the room that's come for the first time? Mm -hmm. Welcome. We have two people here in the room here for the first time. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Welcome. Anyone online? All regulars. I say, yeah, looks like a lot of regulars online tonight. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Adam. Uh, so do we have a quorum? We do. Okay, perfect. So I just wanted to um, move on to the approval of meeting minutes. Is there anyone that needed, had any objections or was looking to have anything changed before we uh, move forward with that, either online or in-house? I see none online, no. Okay, none here either. So uh, we will go ahead and proceed with proceeding the uh, with approving the March 2023 min minutes. Uh, and next, we'll move forward with our treasurer, Ms. Gina Coppins, with our financial report. Yeah. For the month of March, we didn't have any expenditures, so the balance is, continues to be one thousand four thousand one hundred thirty-eight dollars and ninety-five cents. Thank you so much, Tina. We appreciate it. Uh, and then moving forward, we'll uh, have our friend, uh, Lieutenant Michael Pumiati, who is joining us via Zoom with the head of police department for his report. Good evening, everyone. My apologies for not being there in person. Uh, my classmates and I from the academy class uh, all have an anniversary dinner tonight. And so it was the only night that all of our schedules lined up. So I'm just jumping out to give you all a report for the month and then I'll hop back in there with them. So my apologies for not being there in person. Um, so this month uh, was a pretty, pretty good month in Fairhaven. Um, I wanted to highlight a couple of different things. Um, I've received a ton of complaints about some of the corner stores, um, specifically uh, the smoke shop at the Grand Cafe lot, um, the Nino's Market at Ferry and Chatham, Ferry and Peck, uh, the G Mini Mart there, and then also the Noor, N-U-R, uh, grocery store uh, at Ferry and Lombard. Uh, with some of those complaints, we uh, took some enforcement action. Uh, officers went out with uh, tobacco agents, and also um, the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services does some underage purchases of tobacco. Uh, and so three out of those four places, uh, we, we uh, conducted up operations early in the month at all of those 
uh, locations that I mentioned. Uh, three out of the four of them sold to uh, an underage person. Um, so they were uh, given infractions for that. And then um, there was a felony arrest at Nino's Market for um, possession of unlicensed tax stamps. And so they have fraudulent tax stamps that uh, what happens is people will buy cigarettes uh, down south where they are cheaper with less tax, uh, drive them up here, and then um, try to avoid our tax system in Connecticut. And so uh, we conducted investigations at each of those stores. Uh, there were multiple arrests made, including two at uh, the Smokers Market uh, where the Grand Cafe is. Um, and so that was some, uh, hopefully some effective enforcement at uh, looking at some of those uh, the stores and how they're um, not really contributing anything positive to, to Fairhaven at all. Um, and so we're con continuing to um, make sure that they're following the rules and, and um, have the appropriate licenses, et cetera, uh, while maintaining our uh, presence out there to try to deter some of the illegal activity that's happening in and around some of those stores. Um, additionally, I wanted to highlight an incident from a couple of days ago where uh, there was a woman who was struck by a vehicle, a woman and a child were walking across Lombard Street uh, at uh, walking across Ferry Street at Lombard when a white Nissan Altima uh, turned uh, from Lombard, took a left and was going northbound on Ferry uh, and struck the woman and the child. Um, they uh, luckily were okay and didn't suffer any serious injuries, but the person in the Altima fled the scene. Um, Officer McLawrence, who is a Hill officer, and Officer Torres uh, did a phenomenal job tracking down some video footage, and uh, we passed that along to some of our intelligence units and criminal intelligence um, plainclothes officers, and they were able to locate that individual selling narcotics in Hamden. He was placed under arrest there uh, with multiple warrants as well, and so the investigation for the hit and run is still ongoing. However, uh, we believe that we have the offender from that on other uh, drug and warrant charges. Um, so that was a good job by Officer McLawrence and Officer Torres. Um, another incident I wanted to highlight that happened uh, over this past weekend, uh, officers, plainclothes officers were looking for um, a couple of vehicles that were out stolen, used in shootings, uh, that they were in the Fairhaven area. They were looking for those vehicles. They became uh, aware of a vehicle that was a uh, black uh, Infinity. The Infinity uh, was believed to be stolen at the time. Uh, officers tried to stop that vehicle. The vehicle did not stop. However, they were able to deploy our new Star Chase technology, uh, which I've mentioned in previous meetings. And so they deploy Star Chase technology. It sticks to the uh, person's vehicle. And then we use GPS tracking to find that vehicle when it stops and safely apprehend the person. Uh, the person ended up going to West Haven where our plainclothes officers tracked them. Uh, and then uh, they were able to safely deploy stop sticks um, and use stop sticks on the individual's vehicle to get them to stop uh, eventually in Woodbridge. Um, while one of the individuals was running from the vehicle, they threw a loaded clock handgun um, as they were as officers were chasing them. Uh, they also threw a bag that contained uh, an, a significant amount of marijuana packaged for sale and some uh, crack cocaine. And so while the arrest didn't happen in Fairhaven, um, that was still someone who was uh, driving around Fairhaven in a stolen vehicle uh, with a firearm and narcotics that uh, our officers were able to, the plainclothes officers were able to use some of our new technology to safely apprehend uh, people carrying illegal firearms looking to do harm to other people out there selling drugs. A um, couple other issues that we've been working on. Uh, I know there's been some noise, a lot of noise complaints complaint issues on Peck Street. So we've taken some enforcement there the last couple of days. Um, we are looking to um, take some more enforcement up there to try to deter some of the activity. Um, as the summer months are coming along, we're coming uh, up on dirt bike season. So we have a few plans to um, stop some of that behavior early on in the season. Um, neither of those involves stop sticks or our star chase uh, technology, unfortunately. But uh, we just uh, have a new drone system that's been set up and uh, officers have recently been trained on that. And so uh, we're hoping that some of that technology will help us um, get some of the people find the locations where people are storing dirt bikes, especially a number of dirt bikes and quads, um, especially if they're coming from outside uh, the city or the state to uh, engage in these road takeovers. So uh, as usual, if you have any information about where people are storing uh, dirt bikes or uh, individual dirt bikes or uh, a number of dirt bikes, feel free to shoot me a text or shoot me an email um, and let me know the information and we'll gladly have our plainclothes uh, or, or, or fully uniformed officers take some sort of enforcement action on that. Um, 
I think that's just about everything that I have for the month. Um, I know there was a, I'm sorry, let's go to one last thing. Uh, Lewis Street was a, a very um, highly publicized incident. Um, the, we took a number of steps to uh, mitigate some of the issues that were occurring on Lewis Street. Um, these are steps that we take uh, for every incident of gunfire, not just on Lewis Street. Uh, but so some of the things that the police department did, um, we uh, had a number of officers walking out there on Lewis Street, on Peck Street, I'm sorry, Pine Street, Front Street. Um, those officers uh, have been walking out there. We've had additional patrols out there, uh, all shifts. Uh, we towed a couple of vehicles, including uh, one that was a stolen vehicle that was on Lewis Street. And um, in addition, the shooting task force was assigned that investigation. They've made some progress. Unfortunately, I can't give any updates on the progress because it's still ongoing. Uh, but there's, uh, they've made some uh, investigative progress on some of the evidence that we were able to collect that night and some of the video surveillance that we obtained. Uh, officers were actually out there walking today looking for um, surveillance footage of the vehicle as it was fleeing the scene. And so if anybody has any information and or has video surveillance of uh, the, that vehicle's path of travel, again, feel free to reach out to me so that I can pass it on to the investigators so that they can uh, follow up on any leads on where this car may have gone after that incident of gunfire. I know that there's city agencies that are taking some steps as well. I've spoken with the landlords at both locations um, and they have assured me that they have a plan to uh, stop the behavior as well. And um, I know that there's other city agencies that have done taken some steps to um, address the issues that are going on there too. Um, that's it. That's all I have for this month, unless anybody has any questions. Thank you so much, Lieutenant Fumiani. Any questions either? Oh, okay. One question here. Hi, Lieutenant Fumiani. Uh, I just wanted to know, did anybody get shot at the Lewis Street um, situation or just gunshot? Um, so, yes, it was it was um, I, I don't want to say it was only a gunfire incident, but it, it was it was a gunfire incident where no one was struck. Was that around that area where that um, the strip in those vehicles? Is that, a, in that, in that area? Yes. Yes, yeah, so the two houses, eight and twelve Lewis Street. Eight, eight Lewis Street would have been the target of this uh, particular shooting. Okay, thank you. You enjoy your night tonight, huh? Thanks, Robbie. Any questions online? I see no hands raised, so I don't believe so. All right, thank you so much for all you do, you and your officers, and have a great night. Thank you, everyone. You too. Thank you. Go right there. All right. So moving on with Livable City Initiative, we have Ms. Connie Mendez here um, via Zoom with us. So give her report. Uh, and yeah, I'll bring, bring you up here, um, Ms. Mendez. Give me just a second. All right. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. And I hope everyone's having a good evening. Uh, for the month of March, I conducted 46 inspections. Um, and I'll just name the streets, not the addresses, but I'll just name the streets for you so you un you'll see you know, geographically where I've done them. There were four on Dover, 15 on James Street, six wow. on Poplar, seven on Grand Avenue, two on River Street, one on Lewis Street, one on Limerick, one on Clay, one on Lloyd, one on Pine, one in Exchange, five on Ferry, Monroe one. We collected 10 tons of trash in Fairhaven alone for the month of March. There's a lot of trash out there and people are taking on more trash because it's spring and they want to do spring cleanings and they, you have to make a, a bulk trash appointment to do that. You can't just put your trash out. So those people are getting notices of violation. Some have already gotten citations. I know a big uh, thing for people at this point, uh, in Fairhaven in particular, I've gotten lots of complaints of graffiti. I want you to know that I am addressing that as best as I can. I am meeting with Detective Orlando Crespo, who does graffiti. He's a graffiti. <clears throat> 
expert in the police department. And I'm going to be going out with him on Wednesday and we're spending the whole day out there uh, trying to look at all the graffiti and figure out whether it's gang related. Most people will report on C-Click Picks that it's gang related, but that's not necessarily so. Uh, most of it are taggers, people who have, you know, their initials or their name, their monikers, mm -hmm. and they want to get them in as many places as possible. Um, and it becomes a competition uh, between taggers. And it's a really big deal to tag as much as you can, as high as you can, or as low as you can. Um, there's a whole subculture of that. Um, but nonetheless, we're going to go out on Wednesday. We're going to look at all this graffiti in Fairhaven and determine perhaps whether there, is, uh, there are some uh, graffiti that are gang related. And uh, many have received notices of violation. I have had citations issued to certain properties in Fairhaven. And I'll also be re-inspecting them to either close them or stop the citations. Once they start, it's $100 a day. So it's important to keep on top of them. Otherwise, people get charged a lot of money. And that's it. That's my report. Any questions? Uh, we have one question here in the room. Hi, Carmen. Sorry, I didn't get back to you yet. Um, I, we have a big issue throughout Fairhaven. Um, I've been around all over Fairhaven, and I've been noticing a lot of major mechanic work being done in these yards. I'm not talking about spark plugs. I'm talking about motor jobs, transmission jobs, not only those where the oil, the antifreeze, and everything else is going in the yard. And these are not homeowners. These are tenants that are using these backyards. Major, major work. Every day, Saturday, Sundays, holidays, every day. And we need to start addressing some of those problems, please. Absolutely. Um, thank you for that comment. That's very important. I have been in contact with Nate Hogrand of City Plan. He is our zoning enforcement officer until they hire some additional zoning enforcement officers. And I have referred two of them to him. If you notice anyone running an illegal shop, repair shop in their backyard, please call me and let me know where they are because we can easily do the research and find out whether most of them are not legal, but we can uh, issue letters of cease and desist and take some action. So please feel free to call me to let me know um, where they are and I will work with Nate, uh, who's a new deputy director at City Plan, by the way, um, but I will work with Nate so that he can visit these places and uh, close them down. Yeah, they're, they're all over, so it's hard to miss them. <laughs> they are. Many of them, I'm, I've noticed, though, have they have high fences around the front. Uh, they try to hide. They try to hide. Yeah. I know of two places in particular that they do work. The car goes down. They are stolen, and they're stripping them, because that one that I just talked to Fumiati about, on Lewis Street, that vehicle was stripped and put out on the street, and I told him about that. And it looked like the same vehicle in the yard, so it must have might have came from that yard. Um, I don't know how fast they reacted, but we're having a lot of problems like this. No, definitely. As I as I mentioned to you um, in my message to you, let me know as you see them. Right. Um, and I will, you know, I, I communicate with Nate at least five, six times a day. So there's plenty of opportunity for me to report to him, to let him know. Time for me to go out, take pictures, um, share them, share them with him, discuss the issues, look at the zoning maps, that kind of stuff. We can all do that. So if anyone has that kind of an issue on their neighborhood, they should they should definitely give me a call. One more question here. Oh, Ms. Ms. Michael. Um, hi, Carmen. It's Sarah. Thanks hi, for... Sarah. Um, I just want to just follow up on what Robbie asked. We know there's many, many, many of these these chop shops and like illegal auto repair locations around the neighborhood. Lewis Street was one for many years that we've raised and no action was taken. I wonder if you could talk about like how many 
actual violations have been cited around illegal auto repair like the past few years. Um, so we many people have reported them, and we haven't seen a lot of action. Mm -hmm. I'd have to ask Nate that. I will ask him on um, Monday when we get back. Um, I don't know what the numbers are. How many have uh, been on your list? Like, how many have you flagged? Be like, you, are you, even if you're not taking the enforcement action, you're often involved. This ballpark. Um, that I'm aware of. That I'm aware of. There are about three that are in Ward 14. We're here talking about the whole neighborhood. So. What was that? Yeah, so we're talking about the whole neighborhood. All of Fairhaven. Yeah, I, all of Fairhaven, I don't know what numbers they are. Okay, it'd be great to get that number just to get a sense of, you know, how much follow up there really is once we make these reports. All right, I'll keep that. Yeah, that'll be another uh, piece of uh, information that I'll maintain so that I can give it to you the next time. Okay, I appreciate it. Thank you, Carmen. Thank you, Carmen. No problem. You're Thank welcome. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Any further questions online? Uh, I, I actually had one for Carmen. Uh, you had mentioned that the graffiti is kind of blown up and it blew up on my garage. Uh, is there any city programs or anything that can help with uh, removal or the cost of removal? Because I got a quote from like a, a you know a power washer and it's like 350 bucks for one tag. So oh, yeah. is there anything that like the city helps with that or? Some we used to have a graffiti program, um, but our bosses got very disenchanted because we paint over the graffiti, and uh, no sooner did we paint over the graffiti or wash, you know, power washed it, depending on the material, <clears throat> and the graffiti would be back on again. It's a battle. It's a citywide issue, and it's a real battle. It's a real battle. You know, you clean it up. And it's back. Um, there, I'll have to ask whether there is something that we can do because sometimes we have helped people who have a number of tags. We don't normally do it for private properties, but we also understand that it's not a victimless crime, and we try to be as helpful as we possibly can. Um, so give me a call on Monday, and if there's something that we can do for you, we will. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's. I was just wondering if there was like, you know, could I, you know, I'd be willing to pay like, a, you know, the city, if you know, like the city, you know, for labor and water and all that kind of stuff. But three fifty was just a little more than I was expecting for it's very a twelve foot I square. Actually, <laughs> I actually successfully argued, uh, Judge Scarpolino. I, uh, Detective Orlando Cressel and I had um, rounded up three. Uh, graffiti artists, taggers, really. They were taggers. I don't know if you remember Old. He actually ended up dying in a car accident, but Old was everywhere. Dapper was another one. And I argued successfully that graffiti, because it's always been, I've always heard, listen, graffiti is a victimless crime, this and the other. I had successfully argued in front of the judge that it, in fact, is not a victimless crime, that it causes a great deal of undue financial stress on people and that um, you know that it defaces property it makes people nervous uh, people from the outside don't want it there's the perception of an area being dangerous an area it, it just it's just bad so we're trying to figure out what we can do um, we have from time to time have a one-time deal with uh, with property owners and we'll help them remove graffiti. Um, I'll have to check with my boss and make sure that that's okay. And if it is, we'll help you, but it's all, only a one-time deal kind of a thing. Thank you so much, Carmen. Any additional questions either online or so um, I wanted to ask a question directly related to this problem. The, the city, or at least GASDI, the Grand Avenue Special Services District, has contracted and merged to do cleanup uh, of Grand Avenue. They they pick up garbage. They also do other stuff, landscaping and like. 
has the city ever thought of of uh, working with um, with uh, with the merge um, as a possible um, organization to do some of this? Uh, maybe just connecting them with the businesses and with the homeowners that have this problem um, uh, to see if we can start addressing repeating. Because I think you're right that it is a, a, you know you clean it up and they, it goes back up. But if you don't clean it up, it really just communicates stuff we don't want to communicate. Case in point, Brewery Square Apartments has this huge wall. I've been trying to convince them to do a mural on that wall. They, you know, their response is, why would we do a mural? Somebody's going to vandalize it. There's ways around that, but the beginning of it is helping them to keep that wall clean, even if it's a fee for service. So talking to merge, does that make sense? That does make sense. And Lee, you brought up a very important point, and I was actually going to call you about this. Um, <clears throat> I get a lot of complaints on Secret Fix regarding the underpass on Front Street. <laughs> and it, I always call the state, the state cleans it up, and sure enough, there's another complaint. It's a never ending battle. I really would like to talk with you, have some real discussions with you regarding the underpasses. There's one on, uh, you know, the one on Middletown Avenue, the one on, on uh, Front and Middletown to discuss putting murals up there. Uh, because I agree, murals, there's, there was one that was done on Upper Grand Avenue. There's only one side that was done. Um, it's very cute. And no one has, has put any tags on it. No one has vandalized it. They started to vandalize the wall that had nothing on it but paint, but um, the, the mural itself was left clean. I don't know if you're familiar with the beautiful mural around the, on a, around the building on um, Haven Street. Yep. This big purple giant, it's absolutely gorgeous. No one has tagged that at all. Yeah. Let, let's talk about <laughs> that back. offline, um, uh, Carmen, so that we can keep the meeting going. But sure, uh, there's sure. a reason why they don't get tagged having to do with the chemicals that are used. But uh, please call me and we can talk about that. Okay, I will. I will. Thank, Thank you, you, everybody. Thank you. I just have a question. Uh, regarding the Middletown Avenue Bridge, not only is there graffiti, but there's so much dumping of garbage, mattresses. Has anyone ever thought of maybe lighting that more at night and or having cameras so that we can actually get footage of who's dumping or doing vandalism? And it's also not safe if you, you know, if you're walking around and it's starting to get dark, that's a really dark bridge to walk under. I can address the lighting. Um, I'll have to put that down. I can address the lighting under the underpass there. Um, and I can address the graffiti with the state. I call them often. Um, uh, and I'll call the state for additional lighting. Um, the dumping, there's a woman who's actually doing what I used to do for public works many years ago. She's a public space inspector. And I work very closely with her. She's very good. Her name is Cynthia Rivera. And she keeps, if I see something, I'll call her or she sees something, she'll call me. And we often ride together. Um, but I'll, uh, she says it's chronic. Those we were talking about those underpasses, and it's chronic. But uh, she's out there. I'll remind her. I'll call her. And um, and ask for the crew to, at the very least, before they go out to pick up other trash everywhere, at the very least, inspect those underpasses and pick that that trash up first. All right, thank you so much. Um, would you have it's okay. I'm just going to mention the, the mural on uh, Lombard and Fitz Humphrey, actually. And nobody, once, when it was first finished, somebody did something stupid on it that disappeared. It's never been back. And it's almost as if there's a psychology going on that, oh, well, this is an artist. We won't mess with his work. Right, right. Maybe. All right. Yes. Yeah, that makes sense. Any other uh, questions online before we move forward? No. I see none. 
All right, thank you, Adam, for checking. Thank you so much, Carmen. We really appreciate all of your hard work. And if anyone needs to get in touch with either Lieutenant Fumiani or Carmen, their cell phone and email information, contact numbers are on our agenda as well. Thank you so much, Carmen. Thank you. All right. Uh, and just a quick reminder of our quarterly presentation of Jay, Jay Juan Carter with the Civilian Review Board. He does a quarterly presentation for us. And if you wanted to reach out to him with any uh, concerns, his email is on our agenda. It's jwan.carter at gmail.com. And with our economic development update, we have Ms. Kathleen Skrolak, uh, who is here to update us. Hi, everyone. I don't have a, a specific uh, update uh, from last month. Uh, nothing has has advanced uh, except uh, the Stroud School, Sound School, excuse me, Strong School, uh, that I believe uh, others on the call have uh, uh, more up to date information on. Um, very exciting. But if you have any questions for me in general about some uh, economic development initiatives, uh, particularly on Grand Avenue, um, happy to answer. One question here in the, the room. I was wondering if any headway has been made on planning for parking for that strong school building, because that's a problem. Walk by there tonight and there are 58 studios. If that means you need a minimum of 58 spaces more because now you're gonna have a community center as well and people drive into that. So how are you going to accommodate all that parking in an overcrowded area? Hey, uh, they're parking. Kathleen, oh, okay. I don't know if you know that Carmen from Penrose is here. She's going to address that. So, I mean, you can say from City Hall's perspective, but, but the developer is here and we'll be talking tonight. Just so yes. You know. Yes. Uh, but parking and other uh, requirements all go through the site plan. Uh, application process, uh, but I have not seen Penrose's uh, plan, but uh, as Lee said, they're here to present. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions either here uh, in, in the house or um, online? Uh, I just wanted to throw out that I think the Independent had a kind of big article on the gigantic studios, which I know has been a common question uh during this section of our meetings but they they seem to have kind of had a lot of shake up with management and everything but there's a whole article i think it's today i can find it and paste it in the, the title of the article is frame factory growing movie plan silent and it covers a whole bunch of river street stuff Can you say that again? Yes, yeah, the, the, the title of the New Haven Independent wow. article is Frame Factory Growing Movie Plan Silent. Mm -hmm. And uh, it came out yesterday uh, at 11 a.m. Thank you. Okay. Anything else for um, Kathy before we move forward? I, I don't see anything uh, further, so let me just unpin and move on. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. So uh, under our vision in action for responsive, transparent government, economic and community development, we have a few people on with us this evening. First, we have Ms. Victoria Martinez, 
she wants to just quickly talk about initiating a mural in Fairhaven. Is the person you online or okay? Yeah, she's here. Oh, oh, she's here. She's here. She's here. Hi. So, if you make your presentation okay. from over there, then you'll ensure that way you can. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Yeah. Because I want you to be able to be seen by them and by them. So okay. I mean, yeah, if you go over there, right over uh, there. Then that way you can talk one day longer. Okay. Should I hold it up? Thank you, Adam. Oh, what's that? Oh, you said it was for us to see. Yeah, I have a Sobralto sketch. Um, but yeah, my name is Victoria Martinez. I'm an artist. Uh, I have over 14 years of experience um, painting murals in, in Chicago and Baltimore, Latin America, and now. I'm currently painting a mural here through Yale and the city of New Haven. Um, and Sarah Miller helped me um, find the wall, um, which is behind the former um, Seatown grocery store. And um, I brought this um, preliminary sketch um, because the mural that I um, that I was painting is going to be in relation to climate change and then also um, different like um, Latin American, Caribbean, and African. Um, and I'm even open to European um, textile patterns. The reason why it's um, textiles is because I feel as an artist that textiles really relate to different cultures and communities. And there's a lot of like cross-cultural connections between um, fibers. So the middle portion, um, which is mainly red and white and blue, depicts like um, warming stripes. And warming stripes is pretty much like the temperature of the environment. And that will be taken with drones through Yale. But I need your help as a community to kind of help me figure out like which city blocks in Fair Fairhaven I should be documenting with the with the infrared cameras. But then also, for example, the other right and left panels, which are um, pretty much um, patterns. I like for I, I I'm looking I'm searching for community members from Fairhaven to kind of help me um, create patterns. So that way the the mural is not not only my vision. It's kind of like a um, uh, interdependent project that kind of um, that incorporates your voice as well as as community members. Um, so I am willing to kind of start um, leading workshops here at, at the library or um, at the Atwater Center. Just got permission through the city to use that space as a classroom setting to to host workshops and painting workshops. Um, so I I think what would be a good idea for me is to um, Pass around a notebook to see if you if you're interested, and you can write your name and your email address, and then that way I can start to um, to lead workshops here at the library or at Water. And then once it's May six for Fairhaven Day, we can start painting part of the mural, not the entire piece, because um, this is depicting 136 feet. The wall is actually 136 feet wide by 17 feet tall. It's not intimidating to me, but I, again, like I. I think as a community-based artist, I want your input to, to help me create this. So yeah, thank you so much. Thank uh, you so much. Have there asked any questions online or here in the library from the front you have? I have a question. Yes. Um, so will the classes be free or will they be Yeah, everything's free. free. So Yale's covering the, the funding for the paint um, and the materials. Um, I'm trying to get them to also cover some like snacks and occasionally like more like pizza or like sandwiches, um, but everything's free and it's just pretty much um, I'm trying to figure I've, I've been doing this again like for 14 years and it's a lot of fun it's a lot of work too, um, but I think the more um, the most fulfilling thing about painting a mural is like when you work with people so that way that's one way to to avoid vandalism. It's because the mural starts to belong to everyone's vision and hands and and um, and um, just it's it's also it's a sense of home and it's a sense it's a good way to kind of team build in community. So okay. yeah. I just yeah, I, I missed the first one. Where is this proposed mural? It's going to be uh, next next the the wall next to the library. Um, seat the former seat town. Oh, yeah. Yeah. oh okay. Yeah. 
So, yeah, yeah. Does your budget include money for the protective? Uh, once it's finished, will you put a protective coating on it? Yes. So I'm going to use an exterior varnish. Yes. So that's going to protect it from um, the snow, from the rain, and if someone does vandalize it, you, it's, you can easily remove. That's what they did under the highway. So oh, okay. For those of you that haven't seen, that's why it works yeah. to put a mural on. No, no graffiti person from the street puts a special coating over their stuff. I'll pass this around. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, and then uh, a quick question for, we have Denise online, and then I just wanted, you're passing around a, a notebook for the in-person people. Do you have an email that you would like to share with those on Zoom? Yeah, um, so it's uh, Victoria Martina Studio at gmail.com. All right, I'm gonna put that in the chat right now. Okay, yeah, and if you have any questions, feel free to email me. I'll be more than happy to, to answer them. And then also, um, I can also, if I get an email, I can um, send out like information about the workshops. I think the best thing would be to be here at the library for like drawing workshops. And then that way um, there's space here. And then once the actual production of the painting starts at Atwater, um, it's gonna be with a group of high school students, but I'm also aiming to have like community drop-in days where more people can get involved and paint with us as a group. All right, and then Denise had a question as well. Victoria, two quick questions. First, how awesome. Um, so this is really exciting. First question is your timeline. Are you thinking this could be like a summer camp project for the community so that kids have something to do while they're not in school or is the timeline much longer than that? The timeline, I, um, it's due on August 31st. So by, um, by the end of um, July or early August, I'm gonna start installing the, the mural. It's gonna be on parachute plot. So it's like a fabric industrial grade then I have to um, then I have to power wash the wall and then adhere the the, uh, the fabric I'm, at this point I'm not sure if it can be like a summer camp um, because I'm already going to be working with that water youth um, but again there's going to be like community drop-in days where it's open to more families and and people who are who like art awesome the timing is perfect and did I I couldn't tell because of where the squares line up on the laptop screen are you adding a QR code in there for something or we, was that just an artistic thing? The QR code, yes, it is a QR code. So it's, okay, so this is a project, it's a pilot project through um, Yale, the city of New Haven, and it's about climate change, but also um, since I'm the lead artist in the project, I, I have a background in textiles, so that's why I'm, I'm, I'm incorporating the climate change um, aspect, but then also textiles. Um, but then the QR code is going to kind of like explain like the process of the project and um, different research um, that's going to be done through Yale in terms of climate change in, in Fairhaven. Um, and then also this is just the first mural. So I understand um, people love murals, but then also I have an understanding that murals can't please everyone. Um, so although that's the reality, I just want people to keep in mind that this is the first mural, so there's going to be more in the future as well. Awesome. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And we can just email you if we're interested in like one of the classes or something. Uh, I think what I'll do is, that's one good idea, but then I'll, I'll pass out my sketchbook. So if you want to, if you're interested, oh, yeah, yeah. I can stay in touch. That's, that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Okay, so next up we have Carmen from Penrose. Uh, she's joining us via Zoom. Thank you, Adam. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for setting aside time on your agenda for me today. Um, I know I just came back last month, but this a lot happened in the last 30 days. And um, not only did we submit our draft land development agreement uh, to the Board of Alders, we also submitted a petition for a map change. So I wanted to come before you all today to ask for a letter of support uh, in favor of the map change. And I know there's a question about parking that we will uh, address. We have some made, made some headway on that uh, question. Um, so just to remind everyone of the goals, uh, they haven't changed. We're creating affordable housing that's LGBTQ affirming, 
Um, there will be units in here that will be really great for local artists, live work spaces. Um, to be honest, we all kind of live work now from our apartments, so that's no longer a very special designation, um, but there is a lot of really great light in the historic um, portion of the building that we're preserving um, for artists to consider. Um, and we're creating kind of space um, and preserving the former auditorium um, as a programming space. Uh, so I'm just going to summarize some things that were identified in the land development agreement just to keep everyone up to date. Um, it's not related to the map uh, change, but uh, this basically reflects almost everything that was in the RFP, where it's around 58 units. Uh, we're going to form our auditorium, auditorium will be a community use. It will be affordable um, for 30 years, according to the land development agreement, but we're going to uh, get financing from uh, the state, which will probably uh, increase the affordability period. Um, the income tiers range from 30% to 80% AMI that reflect uh, what we had proposed in the RFP. And uh, the city of New Haven has a new executive director of climate and sustainability, um, and he's implementing new standards for the city. And for this project, uh, we've agreed to do enterprise green communities, which is a sustainability standard that a lot of affordable housing projects adopt. Um, the purchase price that we're paying the city is $500,000. Um, the total development cost is $26.5 million estimated at this time. Um, and there will be a tax agreement in place uh, for $450 per unit, uh, all the units, it is for affordable units only, but all the units are affordable. So it applies to all the units in the project. And here you'll see that there are a number of financing sources that we are going to be applying for. And this is basically what it takes to build affordable housing nowadays. It's uh, pulling together all these financing sources and that's kind of my job. Um, so our schedule is um, the Board of Alders accepted the draft land development agreement, as well as the map change uh, petition on, on April 3rd, so earlier this week. The next meeting that we're going to is the City Plan Commission, which will have a hearing on the map change and TBD on the schedule for the land development agreement. Um, and then if City Plan Commission signs off on it, then it'll go to uh, Board of Alders Legislation, Legislation Committee. Um, and since that would tentatively be around May 2nd. So I'm asking for the letter of support for the uh, two meetings highlighted in yellow uh, for this map change. I don't know what the zone change is. Okay. Um, so if the, exactly the zone change is approved, then uh, the next step uh, is that the plans will be submitted to the City Plan Commission for site plan review, which is uh, what was uh, alluded to earlier. Mm -hmm. um, and that will trigger public hearing requirements. And I'll have to call, I'll, I plan to come back to the community management team at that point to get another letter of support for any revisions to plans that may have happened. Um, because right now we had a very initial plan based on the RFP, but we're gonna do more investigations on the building and do a survey of the site so that we can further develop the drawings. And if there are any changes, um, we'll come back to the community management team to present that. So we haven't changed the plan since what was in the RFP as of yet, because we don't have that additional level of detail. But this is what the change is. So. Right now, the Strong School campus actually has three parcels. Um, two parcels are in RM1 and one parcel is in BA1. So the uh, front of the school is in the business district. So we're proposing that the entire campus be under one zone of BA1. Um, and we will also be opting into the city's new inclusionary zoning ordinance. Um, and the reason why we're uh, asking to uh, move from RM1 to, for the whole site to be BA1 is that um, we're non-conforming in building height, density and building coverage. And under BA1, we would be conforming. Um, and that's mainly because right now under RM1, you can only build up to I think 35 feet, which is three stories, but we're proposing a four-story building. Um, 
So the only remaining variance that we would need uh, if the three bullet points on the top uh, proceed um, is the frontage requirement. Uh, so I'll show on the next slide. Um, there is a requirement in BA1 for 75% of their frontage to be within 10 feet of the street. And uh, because of the parking, we're not going to be within 10 feet of the street for 75% of Clinton Ave. So we'll be needing a variance there. Um, we'll be needing to go to the BZA um, and um, once we go through all that process, um, if we get the map change, uh, if we get the variance, we'll go to city plan commission for the site plan review, during which we will need a special permit uh, approval for the community space. So I just wanted to lay out kind of the whole process and what we anticipate coming next if the map change is approved. Um, so this is what I am requesting for this meeting is the motion in favor of submitting a letter of support to the city plan commission and the board of alders regarding the zoning map change for the strong school campus. Um, and to go back to the Carmen, parking, uh, yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead, finish, sorry. Yeah, I was gonna address the question about parking. Um, over the last month, we did have conversations with the, with the New Haven Parking Authority. I think we have a represent, Doug, who is a representative from New Haven Parking Authority is on this call also. And we discussed having a portion of the parking lot that's diagonally across from the site um, with hang tags for residents um, of the strong school who have cars. And maybe it's also because I'm, my background is an urban planner. I usually am in favor of less parking because I think, uh, when you build parking spaces, then that encourages people to bring their cars. And anyone who applies to live or wants to live in this project will know that there's not like a one parking spot for everyone. It's not guaranteed. No one is guaranteed a parking spot. And in our experience, if you build it, they will come. But if you don't build it, oftentimes we haven't had issues of parking. We've had projects where we have less than one parking spot per um, apartment unit and we don't issue any permits or assign parking and uh, we haven't had we usually don't run into any issues and these are in uh, communities like Meriden or Torrington where there's even less density and less transit access um, so I think we can we're at, my team is comfortable with kind of uh the marketing of this and people will come likely without cars because they know there aren't that many cars. But uh, in the event that they are, there is a car issue, I think um, having the residents be able to utilize the lot across the street will help alleviate that. There's a question here in the room. Can you confirm? Um, I have to be uh, uh, Can we get Abby real quick, just because? Oh. Are you are you aware of that area? Because I I don't get that feeling that you are aware of that area. Right now, there is nowhere to park. You have across the street River One, and you have Fairhaven Community Health Center. The people are parked all on Turkey Street. They're down to the corner of Grand Avenue. They're in every single space on Grand Avenue. My my family owns houses on on Grand Avenue and Turkey Street. It is a nightmare. So then I'm looking at this and I'm saying, well, you just covered up the parking lot with four story buildings. Totally inappropriate for that neighborhood. Totally inappropriate. I cannot even believe the hideousness of the pictures that you showed that artist drawings. I can't even believe it. I just, I can't even believe it. But the, but you are obviously not familiar with that area. Can we have some, can we have Doug talk about the traffic, the parking plan? Yeah, and I just want to get Abby in because I think she has to like leave uh, a little bit earlier today. Now. Yes. Sorry guys, I just wanna, um, just so everybody is kind of on the same page and aware of what the zoning request is. Carmen, can you confirm that this request for these particular parcels is not 
going to require like knockdowns. It doesn't actually go into existing properties on Perkins Street or does it? Oh, it's only for the three parcels uh, that are part of the redevelopment project. It doesn't affect any abutting properties. Okay, got it. That is great to know. Okay, that was my question. Thank you, Abby. Um, yeah, is, can we get um, Doug um, to also contribute to the conversation, please? Hi, good evening. Uh, Doug Houseley, an executive director for the New Haven Parking Authority. I live over on Olive Street. Um, so we are the managers of the parking lot across the street, which has some 60 or so parking spaces. And our envisionment, our, our plan would be to, um, you know, there's four rows of parking, if you will. So our, our plan, our goal would be to turn the final row, the one furthest from the street into a 24 hour a day residential hang tag uh, parking area where people could then park for 24 hours a day. In theory, the lot is not a 24 hour lot presently. It's also not a paid lot. Uh, this would create uh, a, a small residential parking fee that the residents of the development would be available uh, to, to apply in our system and be a, a, a parking authority customer. So um, uh, if you're not familiar with the Grand and East Pearl lot, let me know. Uh, I can drop the, the Google map link in the chat and happy to answer any other questions. I did hear concerns about parking on side streets and in former life, I was in the city of New Haven and I, I could recommend residential parking zones, which would be one potential way to help manage the um, uh, any undue influence of commercial uses on Grand Avenue parking on side streets. Uh, and I'm here to answer any questions and thanks for the invite, Carmen. Um, I'll get to you in just a I just um, wanted to bring something up that I feel is extremely important, um, not just because it affects my family, but a lot of families in New Haven. So I don't think it's any um, secret that Connecticut Transit it does not provide sufficient service yeah. as it is. And so I just don't understand, like, you know, I, I don't know, I'm just trying to understand how all this is going to work. Um, I don't know, I just have like a lot of feelings coming up about it right now, um, especially over there in that area so far down Grand Avenue and the bus service uh, during the week, let alone on Sundays is, is yeah. not early enough, it doesn't go late enough and everything in between. I just don't see how this is going to be an equitable um, plan for everyone in the community. Yeah. Yes. Oh. Um, when I was walking here to this meeting, we passed that parking lot and it was pretty full. Yeah. And my question is, if you take some of those away from residential parking, what happens to the people who want to go to those businesses? It just doesn't seem like a win-win. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, but you know, it doesn't. And it was, you know, we were walking here between 5.30 and 6, and that lot, there weren't too many spaces left. And I don't know how many that fourth row would allocate to the building, but then that still leaves quite a few places people can't park. So yeah, that's my concern. Mm -hmm. you want no, I, I had a question for the other lady. Oh, okay. The question that I have is that uh, you said that presently the footage between the front of the building and the street is 10 feet, and you're looking for a variance to change the footage between the front of the building and the street to what? Oh, so I that's the frontage basically is the distance between the street and the building. So uh -huh. it, it, it's saying that it should be within 10 feet of the street, meaning it should be closer to the street. Um, um how many feet from the street? So uh it'll the historic school itself sits farther than 10 feet from the street. In some places it's 15, in some places it's even farther than that from the street. So it varies along the entire uh what are you asking for. Uh, we're right now we're not asking for a variance on the street frontage 
Uh, right now, we're just asking for the entire site to be zoned under BA1. Um, what does BA1 stand for? Sorry, I couldn't hear that uh, clarification what question. Does, what does BA1 stand for? Uh, it's one, it's the business district one, which is a uh, zoning uh, district. Uh, every parcel in the city, the city has set what the zoning requirements are. Um, yeah. So what are the setbacks for the BA1? Is it still the 15 feet, 10 feet, 5 feet? Uh, so for the setbacks, um, we don't, so we comply under the residential district setbacks. Um, so we'll still be uh, more than 10 feet from the back, from the set, for setbacks. So you'll be more than 10 feet from the, from the street? From the, from the rear and side. Uh, for the streets, the zoning district actually requires us to be within, to be as close to the street as possible, actually. Four story building, barely on the street. Yeah, not a My question was for the variance on Clinton Avenue because that, that corner of Clinton Avenue coming off of Grand. It's very tight as it is. Yeah. Um, Especially for I don't know what you mean by you need a variance on that corner. That, that yes. Nice Sorry, corner. let me clarify that. So the um, corner of this street is where the historic building sits, and we're not touching the historic building. So this, uh, what you see on Grand Avenue, uh, will not change because that Clinton. building will stay exactly where it is. Clinton Avenue. Yeah, Clinton. on Clinton. You Clinton. need a variance on Clinton. Uh, because uh, we're, it, it basically on Clinton Avenue, the zoning district requires for us to have the entire building up against the street. And we're saying we can't do that because we're going to have the parking. So there's going to be the, the farther back portion of Clinton is not going to be up against the street, which is the variance that we're asking for. If we're complying with it, then the entire building will be up against the street. But we're not. We're letting, we're giving more breathing room on Clinton Avenue. Can I piggyback on what he's talking about? Are you talking about extending from the sidewalk into the street on Clinton Avenue? No, we're not going to be into the street. Uh, I'm just saying that the building will not be up against the street, uh, but the zoning asks us to be up against the street. So we're asking for variance from, from that. To so give more, more space to the public. It would be on the street. And that's a problem on Clinton, especially with the buses. You have those long buses that can barely turn the corner from Clinton onto Grand. Um, yeah, the corner of Clinton and Grand will stay as it is right now because the building that's there, the strong school building that's there right now at that corner will stay there and it's going to largely look the same. They, they, they're asking just just because I'm just hearing people go around and around. They're asking to not have the rest of the building that they are going to build be at the same level, which is closer. They're not asking to move it closer to the sidewalk. They're asking to move it back so that it provides more room. You, you, you understand? So so they're actually asking for something that helps us. Right. They would have to put the new building they're building, which, by the way, is right next to my house, yeah. 18 feet <laughs> from my property line. They're asking that that building be set back, just like the fences. You, you ever notice that when you come down Clinton Avenue, there are cars that can park right outside the playground? Mm -hmm. they're, they're asking that their building be back like that instead of being up on the sidewalk closer to where the old building Carmen, I, what I wanted to do is I, I wanted to speak as the owner of a property that is adjacent to this for uh, fo folks. I, I respected you. I, I'm going to ask you to respect me in terms of time. So what I, what I wanted to say is just that my family and my neighbors across the street, both sides, 
both sides of the street have suffered this building being in the condition it's in for the better part, for a decade, not the better part, for an entire decade. 2012 is the last time it was used. Now, if somebody's got a, a, you know, a couple of million dollars and they want to buy it and do something else, but the, the, the alternative to this was the guy three years ago, he wanted to put 33 units in. Uh, I mean, it was just totally crazy. Market rates. It was just all these things we didn't want. And over 60 people from this community shut him down. And now we have somebody, this is not perfect. Nothing is perfect. But the truth of the matter is that if we take um, Doug's advice and, and do what Worcester Square does, what East Rock does, which is to have zoning. So in certain areas on Perkins, on Clinton, only residents can park, not the people from the health center. If we want to talk about the health center, the problems they're causing, that's great, except this isn't them. That's not the health center. Let's talk to the health center about the problems that they're creating. Right now, the city's getting zero money from that property and spending the last time we asked the school department, 40 to $60,000 a year, just maintaining the building to the level that you see. This is not to make it nice. This is to, to what we're seeing now. So. Again, we should have a conversation about this. We should vote about this, but we have come a long ways from this building being unused or being put on the market for market rate. When we know that in this neighborhood, we need more, um, more low-income housing that's properly managed. And that's why I personally like this company because they will build it and then they will hold on to it. They're not gonna build it and flip it. They have a, a construction company and they have a management company and they're gonna manage that. So I'm happy to continue this conversation. We do have our bylaws tonight and there's gonna be a vote and people should vote whatever they think is in the best interest of the community. But um, I don't know if anyone else has, you know. I, I, Lee, actually, I had a, a question for Carmen regarding the vote. Uh, you mentioned a couple times throughout your presentation that the vote tonight is just for the zoning map change. Yes. Um, the language of the vote you asked for in email uh, states this support extends to the zoning map changes, site plan review, and any further zoning relief that might be required in connection with this project. So it's a blanket statement of support for the entire project, not just the zoning change. I'll, I'll edit that. Um, I meant that this is just for the map change. So it's you want it to be just for the zoning change? Yes. Okay. Go back to the map for a second. Well, Sarah, go ahead. Yeah, I think I have a question is a good one because we're not talking about the whole project. We're talking about just this, just this zoning change. But I just want to address the concern. Part of developing our neighborhoods, part of making Grand Avenue more attractive for people to come and patronize the businesses, part of development means we have to figure out part of it. And there's not every community deals with this. It's a challenge everywhere. So I think we're what we're saying is we can we use all the tools at our disposal, the RZP on Perkins, maybe RZP on Clinton. That's where only people who live there can park there. Start using the um, um, part of the parking lot, perhaps convert that lot to a pay lot so that it is more limited and people aren't just parking there um, just because. And, and figure out what other tools are at our disposal to manage it. Because we don't want to not develop our community because we're concerned about parking. We want to develop our community and think creatively about how we solve the parking and transportation problems together. So that's what I want to urge us to think about as we move through the process. But can I think that in terms of parking, you're talking about people with limitations on their income. Those people usually cannot afford a car. So normally those people are gonna rely on public transportation. So I don't, but people in that building, I don't see where parking is that critical. And I think that's what Carmen is saying in her in the other developments, which are overwhelmingly affordable developments, they haven't found a problem because there's only a significant number of the people living there who don't have a problem. Mm -hmm. and, and we're literally right, and yes, 
CT Transit is not what we want it to be. We need to advocate for that, yeah. but but um, but it's what we have, and it's literally right there. So it's it's you know it's a good place for people who rely on public transportation to live. Yeah. I just I just wanted to very quickly point out the reason why this is bifurcated, why this is business where the school is and these are different is because if you look at a map from the 1800s, the, there were two houses where the playground there was there was a house, just like the house that I have that 29, and there was a house on Perkins, and Granite Street used to run here, right through the extension of the building that, that they're gonna knock down. That's why, so so what this results in, just this part of zoning is, it takes these properties that for at least, at least since 1915 have been school property and for decades have been an extension of the building and the playground. And it says those properties now are gonna be in the same category as this property. This is all one property. That's all the zo this zoning piece does, that's it. I just wanted to say a couple of things. You're assuming, a number of people are assuming that the people are going to rely on public transportation. That may or may not be true. You don't know who's going to uh, want to rent or live in this building. So that's kind of, a, to me, that's kind of a... If you earn thirty thousand dollars a year, assumption. assumption that you don't know. Uh, I know a lot of people who are low income, they own cars, but that's... And you know the, the other issue with parking is we're going to limit the parking on the side streets, Perkins, Clinton, whatever, to the residents of this building. Then you're telling people at the other businesses that that support the other businesses that where are they going to park? So that's kind of those two things concern me. It sounds like a great plan, but there's a lot of things that people are saying it's not going to be a problem. You don't know that. You might have people who move in there who do. Parking's the big issue. I live in a small condo community, and parking is a huge issue. So I'm just raising that because that would be my concern if I lived there. Because I know when I go down to that area, pretty much parking. No, that's my piece. One more question, comment in the back uh, here. Oh, I, I have a question. Um, given the current economic and and um, you know with, with, with banking and bond market and all that you know do you see any problems securing financing with the uh with this project yeah so i think the difference between market rate housing and affordable housing is that market rate housing is very i guess i don't know if i would say volatile but very dependent on market conditions of uh and I know even in the city of Boston, where we have projects that market rate developers aren't developing uh, market rate rentals right now because it's the it doesn't the economics don't make sense. But as I demonstrated in one of my showed in one of my earlier slides, where affordable housing projects because the rents are gonna be capped, rely on state subsidies. They've always relied on state and federal subsidies and this one will also. We're gonna be applying to the state housing finance agency for tax credits. We're gonna be getting uh, historic tax credits. So that means that for projects like this, they're generally more stable and will proceed kind of regardless of whether interests, like whether, uh, because the rents are capped, there's always going to be demand for it. So uh, it's much more, uh, even from a foreclosure perspective, the foreclosure rates for projects like this are like mm. minuscule compared to rental projects because it's kind of more insulated from market forces because uh, it's a subsidized program that relies on federal and state subsidies. Mm. That's a question. Um, is it possible, like, you know, this company has done projects in cities like Boston or whatever. Is it possible to maybe have someone talk in a little more detail of how that was done and if the area was similar as far as parking and how, how that happened? Because I think that would be helpful because a lot of people are saying, well, we don't know, but if you gave a really 
a good example of something that has been done and that is now a good working model or is successful, I think that would be helpful to the community. Yeah, I would say, I mean, every, as someone made the comment earlier, like your community is different and that specific area is different. Um, and, we, but we do have examples where we, where we've done projects throughout uh, Connecticut in places like Meriden and Torrington or in city of Boston, where city of Boston right now has no zoning, no parking requirements. And we have a project that's 88 units that has no parking. I have another project right now that is 74 units where we have park, five parking spots. Uh, it's next to two commuter rail um, stops. Um, so we are doing this in numerous places. All right, thank you so much, Connor. In the interest of time, this is definitely a very important uh, conversation for us in our community. But in the interest of time, we, we would like to uh, go ahead and move on. Thank you so much for your presentation, Connor. Um, and of course, we can always uh, touch back on this in future uh, meetings that we have. Uh, under environment and immigration. Uh, I, Oh, go ahead. Robin says she's not coming. Robin said she's not coming. Oh, she's not there. Oh, all right. Uh, can I can I speak on the vote for the the strong school development uh, that will be coming out tonight as well? Yes. All right. I uh, oh, Karen, can you or Carmen, can you stop your share? I can. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yep. Uh... Um. So we do have a vote, one vote tonight. It is on the thing that we just heard about. It covers only, as you heard me talking to Carmen only earlier, only the moving the strong school as a whole into one district. It doesn't cover parking. It doesn't cover variances. It doesn't cover any of this stuff. They can get another vote on that in the future. This one's just, do we want the strong school to be one district in, in like zoning? So. Uh, that vote will be going into chat and into your emails that you come home. Uh, and you can just put your name in. And there's only one vote tonight. Yes, no, abstain. Um, and I'll put that chat into the vote and, or into, I'll put that vote into the chat as well as uh, Abby will be sending it out in her follow up with the minutes and everything. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aaron. All right, uh, and with help from housing and public safety, we have Ms. Denise Dean uh, with the Patient Partnership of Fairhaven Community Health Center. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for your time. I stuck my head in here last month with a quick blurb, and I'm prepared now to announce with greater detail that we are beginning. So a quick refresh at Fairhaven Community Healthcare, we're really trying to reinvigorate our focus on listening better to our patients and tying in a partnership with them because they know best what they need in their healthcare journey. So I'm the Plain Tree Coordinator. My job is to, well, basically help take care of all the people, um, staff and patients. And so my mission with this job is to really get this group going groups. We will have two groups. We will have a group in Spanish and a group in English. We will have an open house to invite folks to that. Um, and I, if you'll hold one moment, I will um, share my screen with the flyer. So um, on April 15th, folks can give me a holler to RSVP and come by the main clinic at 374 Grand Avenue. The Spanish group, I will meet with them first and answer any question they may have and talk about the goals of the group, have some snacks. There's also an opportunity to join in this by Zoom. Um, I just wanted to put this up here. If people wanna take a picture of it now, uh, there will be flyers up in all of the sites of Fairhaven and a matching English flyer as well. So the English group will be a little bit later, same day. When the actual group will be held, 
that really if it's going to be a patient group needs to be decided by the patients that want to take part in the group. So I did the choosing for the open house based on talking to probably a dozen people, patients and staff, all the different sites, all different levels. And they actually directed me to a Saturday. I don't know if that's gonna work or not, um, but we need to start somewhere. So we're starting on the 15th. Um, if you'll hold one moment, I will, uh, I will, oh, my challenge is always, how do I stop sharing the screen? Hang on one second. Um, I can also just drop these two documents into the chat. That might be easier. Um, but I'm really excited to start this project. We often uh, get feedback from our patients, but this is a way to do it in a really mindful way and a little bit more regular and deliberate way where we'll spend half the meeting um, hearing directly from patients what's going on with them and their care at Fairhaven and the other half sort of letting them in a little bit with some of, some of the ideas and initiatives that we have to say, this is what we're thinking of doing. This is a new project we're thinking of starting. What do you think? Um, so with that, thank you for whoever did that. I appreciate that. <laughs> with that, I am happy to answer any questions you and anyone may have. Um, doors wide open. I'm really excited. Thank you so much. Any questions here in the library? I don't see anything on the, anything online. I don't, I don't see anything on our end. I don't see any now. All right, thank you. Okay, I will throw the two flyers into the chat. Please uh, take that photo, send it around. I'd love to see as many faces as possible to make that decision if this is right for you. All right, thank you so much, Ms. Dean. Thank you. And uh, next up, we have Kirk with the Fairhaven Library for uh, Arts, Culture, and Library segment. Hey, everyone. Uh, welcome to the library, or if you're online, please come see us soon. Um, a week from today, uh, on uh, April 13th, we are going to um, have a, um, uh, a workshop with the Connecticut Library for Assess Accessible Books. Uh, it's the library that used to be known as the Library for the Blind. Um, we will have their uh, director, Matt Giza, here. Um, although we, of course, have many resources here in uh, New Haven Free Public Library, we don't always have um, some of the more specialized materials that people who may have um, accessibility or disability issues uh, can access. Uh, so uh, Matt Giza, the uh, director of the, of the uh, State Library for Accessible Books will come in to talk about uh, who is eligible to receive uh, these free services, uh, can sign up anyone who, um, who uh, may be eligible and can answer any of the questions about the services and equipment that they provide. Uh, all of these services are free to anyone who's a resident of Connecticut. Um, I, uh, and my understanding is that the process to um, become one of their uh, patrons is pretty simple, um, but, uh, but he'll be here at six o'clock uh, next Thursday um, and he'll be uh, talking about all of their services. Um, also, um, I wanted to plug a, um, a program on Saturday, April 22nd. Um, uh, for, any of you, uh, for any of you who um, visit our uh, weekly story time for pre-Ks, uh, you may know uh, Nora Bernal. She's a volunteer and helps lead that bilingual uh, story time. Uh, she is actually an author herself. And, uh, and on, so on April 22nd, there's actually going to be a launch of a book that she wrote, a bilingual uh, book, and the illustrator also happened to be her husband uh, and they're uh, New Haven residents. So, um, so if you have young kids or you just uh, wanna support a local author who is uh, a friend of the Fairhaven Library, uh, come in to see Nora on uh, Saturday, April 22nd to see the launch of her new book. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kurt. All right, and next up, we will talk about voting on the new bylaws. All right, uh, well, I'm gonna see how far we can get tonight. Um, <laughs> uh, we're, we're that, that took a little bit longer than I thought we had uh, originally planned for it. So, uh, Everyone in person, uh, if you don't know, I, I can tell you in, in the room, uh, Darlene Lee, Mike Fumiati's not there, but uh, Christina, 
Kirk is online. Um, Laverne, uh, Robbie, uh, John Stallworth, Gina Toppins, Liz, Christina Oliver, and Abby, you're all voting members. So feel free to vote on this. Uh, if I didn't mention you, you're not a voting member yet. Uh, everyone online, if you notice next to your name, I've put all of our voting members have a little asterisk in front of their name, if you're wondering what that was. That's just so we can easily tell who's a voting member and who's not. Um, I'm gonna go through the bylaws that our bylaw committee uh, put together. It was myself and Patty Scussel and Dave Weinreb and Darlene Casella. Uh, and I am going to see if you have any problems with any of the different points that we go through. Uh, feel free to ask a quick clarifying question. Uh, but I wanna try and get through as many as I can with just kind of unanimous approval. And if there's any that somebody has more than a question and they wanna you know, discuss it, we're gonna table it for now and move towards that if we have, when we have, if and when we have time. So, uh, there's that. Um, all right, uh, and I just wanna test uh, all of you Zoom people, you should have gotten just a, a little poll pop-up. Uh, or nope, right now you should have a poll pop-up. Uh, if you could just give me a, a quick click on that, just so I can see if that is in fact working all all right. Um, cool, looks like it's coming in. If you have any problems, please speak up. Um, and, and this one, that was just a test. All right. So, proposed bylaws. Everyone can see this on your screen? Yes? Yeah. Okay. Um, the first one, Article 1, Statement of Purpose. Uh, I don't believe that this has changed at all from the, the, the last version. Um, this is to state, our Statement of Purpose is to build community and improve the quality of life and safety of the Fairhaven community through the integration of neighborhood groups businesses and institutions working collaboratively with the Department of Police Services. The activity of the Fairhaven Community Management Team may include, but is not limited to, the development, implementation, and management of sustainable community development, economic opportunity, and community-based partnerships through strategic neighborhood planning in Fairhaven. So that's why we exist. Uh, does anyone have any questions about this? Hearing none, does anyone have any objections or does where are the change? Have you made changes to this? No. I no. do not believe so. No. That's what I thought. Okay. Not this area. Yeah. Okay. Doesn't no one has any problems with this? All right. We will consider that passed by majority then. Uh next statement. Membership. Uh A1 has not changed. If you live in Fairhaven and you're 16 or older. You can be a member. Anyone 15 or younger, you know, your parents can be members, but you, you can't yourself be a member. Uh, section two has changed slightly from the last one. So now it reads, the owner or authorized representative of a business, an institution, or an organization with a physical address in Fairhaven or that does significant work in the Fairhaven neighborhood. For purposes of this definition, a PO box does not serve as an address. Each business and institution is limited to one voting member per meeting. So the, the only change here is that we said that you can also be, you know, not just if your organization has its official address in Fairhaven, but if you are an organization that does a lot of work in Fairhaven, you can be a member of this organization, of the community management team. Does anyone have any questions? Concerns? Uh, Did I hear something from the library? No, I'm just saying I don't see anything here. All right. I see no concerns. Um, if somebody could holler at me if something pops up in chat, just because it's the screen sharing is, oh wait, can I, I can, aha, independently pull up chat. All right. Uh, membership, section B, section subsection one. Each Fairhaven Community Management Team member as previously defined, who has attended either in person or online five of the previous 12 meetings is considered a voting member. 
Attendance at the meeting at which voting is taking place is not counted in terms of voting eligibility. Members must attend at least 50% of a meeting to have their attendance counted. The thing that changed here is we added the, the language either in person or online to be attendance. Uh, that's how we've been operating, but that's not how it was worded in the old version. Does anyone have any questions? Problems? All right, I will consider this unanimous as well. All right, moving on. Section B2. The attendance of a representative of a business or institution shall be divide, defined as attendance by that organization when the individual signs in stating that he or she was representing said organization. It is the responsibility of a business or institutional voting member whose representative also qualifies as a resident voting member to send a separate voting representative that they so desire, satisfy membership voting requirements. A, a person may officially represent only one business or institution at, at any one meeting. So this, uh, I don't think this has changed either. Um, this just says that uh, if you want to be here as a representative of uh, a community organization or, you know, uh, your your work or something like that, and you have to tell us that, um, you know, we have multiple different people who uh, can represent Mary Wade home. Uh, we have multiple people that can represent Fairhaven Community or Community Healthcare. Um, but if you you're you know also a resident, uh, you know you got to let us know if you're you know <clears throat> signing in as a resident as your representative. Uh, you can and also you can only be one thing. I can't come in and say I'm representing every business on Grand Avenue. That no, you want pick one. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? Problems? All right, we can consider that passed. Moving to the next section. Voting is based on one member, one vote. If a voting member is unable to attend, they may appoint someone to serve as their proxy for the duration of a meeting. The voting member must provide written correspondence, e.g. a signed letter, an email to fairhavencmt at gmail.com to appoint, officially appoint a proxy. Therefore, each person should, who attends a proxy a meeting as a voting member shall have no more than one vote, whether she, he or she attends a meeting as an institution or a representative of a business or institution. So I think the only thing we changed here um, is the fact that we, we stuck the email in there. It used to be, you know, like send us a letter only. You can send us an email, that works too. Does anyone have any questions on point proxy? Of clarity, point of clarity. Yes. So if, if, um, if uh, Liz gives me her proxy when it's time to vote, then I can say, uh, here I'm voting for Liz, here's Liz vote, and then here's my vote. Yeah. So I, I can represent myself and one other person. I can't represent a third person, correct? Uh, well, if you have your proxy. Wait, wait, oh, uh, no, so you, you the, the, we, theoretically, every single person could say, Lee Cruz, you are my proxy. Um, okay. They would all have to write us letters, sign okay. letters or emails saying that. Uh, but the, the, the point of this is that each person only gets one vote. So, uh, yeah. Either in person or by proxy. Oh, okay. Either in person or by proxy. So you can't say, this is my proxy, and then show up and vote yourself, too. You don't get two votes. You mentioned, no, no, you mentioned written correspondence. Do they know an address to write to? You have an email designated, but you don't have an address designated. I was going to say, unfortunately, we don't have an address. Um, so the sign letter would have to be delivered in person at the like a previous meeting, um, or uh, we don't. But we don't have a PO box or anything that people could deliver anything to. Right. All right. Does anyone have further clarifying questions? Does anyone have any objections or things that they would want to change with this? All right, we can consider that. Okay, as well. Moving on. Uh, B4. A quorum constitutes 50% plus one of the voting members. Quorum is required to pass any votes during the course of a meeting. As of right now, we check for quorum. Any votes conducted outside of a meeting, like the ones that we send to 
uh, your email address, or if we ever do a mail in vote, which we don't have a PO box, so I don't know, uh, must have at least 72 hours notice between the opening and closing of a vote. That's primarily all these these links that I send out. We're never gonna, you know, send out a link and 20 minutes later close the vote and be like, oh, it passed. You get three days. Does anyone have any questions on this one? Any desire to clarify or desire to alter or discuss? All right, moving along. Section C, the Fairhaven Community Management Team will consistently strive to reach all stakeholder, stakeholders, including our more marginalized residents in our work and ensure the needs of all re residents are represented. This has not changed in the slightest. Uh, and, you know, we can argue how well we do at all this, but uh, does anyone have any questions about this? Nope. Any desire to change or discuss? All right, I'll consider that one passed. All right, this one is completely new. In the event of extenuating circumstances beyond the control of the Fairhaven Community Management Team in which a member is not able to attend, members may petition the executive board to have the affected meetings not count towards the last 12 meetings. And we talked about you have to be at five of the last 12. Extenuating circumstances may include, but are not limited to severe weather events, library closures, large scale internet slash power outages, outbreaks of communicable diseases, et cetera. All such petitions must be delivered in written form. Again, a signed letter, email to the, the email address with an explanation of the barrier to entry to the affected meetings. The affected meetings will not count towards the last 12 meetings for petitioners upon unanimous approval of the executive board. So this one is, you know, we, so if we're having a meeting and, you know, Zoom uh, doesn't work and half our people come, Zoom, you know, we're pretty much half and half in person and Zoom. And if Zoom is down, uh, half our members can't come. And so they can say, hey, I, I tried to come, I couldn't. Uh, you know, if there's a, a tornado going by, you can say, hey, there's a tornado, I can't go to the meeting. Um, we just want you to, to write to us and say, hey, that meeting should not have counted for my last 12 because there was this major event uh, that are, you know, an extenuating circumstance beyond an individual control. So you can't say, hey, it's it's you know, it's my birthday party that night. That mm -hmm. that doesn't count. Does anyone have any clarifying questions on this one? Does anyone want to uh, discuss this or make any potential changes? Did I hear something? Sorry, I heard a mumble from the library. No. Nope. Oh no, nothing. We're good. Okay. All right. Cranking through. All right, officers. The Fairhaven Community Management Team will elect annually from among its members two chairs, a vice chair, a treasurer, a recording secretary, and a corresponding secretary, which should reflect the diversity of the neighborhood. These members will comprise the executive committee. None of this has changed. This is exactly what it is currently. Does anyone have any questions? Concerns? Alterations? That one passes, moving along. The chairs and two officers will preside at all meetings and nominate the heads of all subcommittees. Um, I, <laughs> I'm on the committee and I think I missed something here. Uh, this should say that at least one chair and two officers will preside at the meetings and nominate Hall. Um, that, so, that so that one's going to have to be a little bit different. So that one has not passed yet. I put my own kibosh on that one. All right. Section C, the vice chair will manage the role and, and attendance at all meetings, as well as keep all records of attendance up to date. The vice chair will also assist the chairs in maintaining the matters, maintaining matters of order and decorum at all public meetings. In the event that both chairs are unable to attend a meeting, the vice chair will chair the meeting. Um, this is all pretty much new. Uh, currently in our, our current bylaws, the vice chair has almost no rules, responsibilities whatsoever. Uh, we decided to make it more in line with what the vice chair has been doing for the last few years. 
Uh, we do have a, a question from Maureen. What happens if the vice chair needs to chair a meeting? Who then handles the role and the attendance? It just seems to me that'd be a lot. Do you need to specify one of the other officers, of which there are what, two others? <laughs> All right, that sounds like uh, an alteration worth discussing to me. So we're gonna say that this one does not pass with unanimous consent because that's a valid thing we should discuss. All right, so moving along. The treasurer will be responsible for the accounting and handling of the funds and will make monthly financial reports as well as an annual financial report in January. Any bank accounts may require two of the authorized signatures. Uh, what was that? Two of the authorized signature. Oh, okay. Um, so yes, uh, we do have two signers uh, to our, our bank account. Um, the other one is going to be under the uh, corresponding secretary, which is later in the, the bylaws. Did we modify that? Uh, so uh, we are going to uh, modify the proposed corresponding secretary one to say that the corresponding secretary is responsible for signing any checks that are paid to the order of the treasurer. Um, but did we have other potential modifications that we wanted to make to this? No, that's perfect. All right, uh, Pastor Boone and then uh, Maureen. When you say uh, the treasurer will be responsible for the accounting and handling of the funds, um, and we, any bank accounts may require to, you, you mean any bank transactions? Uh, yeah, I mean that you know we don't really have a petty cash, mm -hmm. uh, you know thing. We just have the bank account, but uh, it's kept intentionally general in case the event that uh, you know there is you know we do a fundraise or something and there's a, a chunk of you know cash money that's not in a bank account. They're responsible for all all fund handling. Okay, uh, Maureen. Well, I do find that last sentence. Um, having done this work in the past, not totally clear. D to say may require, I think it should have another sentence maybe that specifies in what situations. Otherwise, the treasurer, how would they know in which cases they needed to get someone else's counter signature on a check or, or release of funds? So can we hold yep. that over? Yeah, that's a, that's, that's a legitimate thing to discuss. And We'll we'll hold until we get through all these uh, unanimous ones. All right, E, the recording secretary will be responsible for the contents of the minutes and uh, of the minutes of the minute of the oh of the minutes of the meetings and their distribution to members and will preside at all meetings. So we do need a recording secretary here. Uh, we do in the next section say that uh, in the event that the recording secretary is not like the specific person, the the, the corresponding secretary uh, uh, takes up their duties. Do we have any questions on this one? Any concern? All right, you're fine. This one, I know, we have to change. <laughs> like I said, uh, we, we need to put something in here about how the corresponding secretary is responsible for signing any checks paid to the order of the treasurer. So I know we, we, this was already brought up uh, in our, our, our board meeting last week. So I know that one's gonna change. G, no decision-making employee of the city of New Haven pursuant to the city's code of ethics or any elected official will be eligible to hold elected office in the Fairhaven community management team. Um, I am, I, I'm going to consider that a typo that it doesn't say community management team. Uh, so uh, yes, 
does anyone have any problems? I'm going to change that right now, the community management team. Um, but this is straight boilerplate from the, the old bylaws and the city of New Haven. Does anyone have any questions? Problems? No, All right. Article four, requirements for legal meetings. A, Robert's rules of order will govern the general conduct of meetings. These rules, however, can be superseded by the needs of the community. In a meeting, a supermajority two thirds vote can be called to suspend the use of Robert's rules and use the best judgment of the body as long as a quorum of voting members has been met. So this originally just said Robert's rules, we're gonna do that. Uh, the problem with that is uh, one, uh, you know, we, we don't have too many people who are 100% perfect at Robert's rules and all that kind of stuff. And two, uh, I could use Robert's rules to make sure that we never have a functional meeting again. Um, and in order to, to combat that, uh, we've added this clause that as long as we have a quorum, if two thirds of the people there agree, we can kind of shut down whoever's, you know, point of order, point of order, point of order. And we only have two hours every month. So that was the intent of this rule. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Does anyone want to make any potential changes or discussion? Seeing none, moving on. Point of order. Yes. <laughs> it's nine minutes of eight. How, how, many, how, much, how many more are there? Uh, I'm on slide. 17 of 26. Okay. So at some point, giving about five minutes, we should allow for um, just, uh, you know, at, at, at uh, 755, just allow for a few minutes for uh, quick announcements, and then we should continue at the next meeting. All right. I will stop myself by that point, and I'll try and crank through as much as we can so we have very little to do next time. All right. Fairhaven Community Management Team will meet as designated. Me meetings shall be scheduled no less than 10 times per calendar year. Meetings will normally occur on the first Thursday of the month at 6 p.m. Monthly meeting announcements will be made on the Fairhaven Community Team website and distributed via email. So I got to get my butt on this if this passes, because right now it doesn't say anything about the website. And that's me. Um, so uh, the, the major change here is it had uh, some kind of vaguer language around the the summer party thing that we used to do. Uh, we just made it 10 times a year at least. Uh, we can do the full 12. I think we've done the full 12 for the last few years. Um, and then first Thursday of the month at six, that's what we do now. And uh, you get the email and it'll be on the website. Does anyone have any clarifying questions? Does anyone have any desire to discuss or alter? Seeing none, I will consider it pass. C, the first Thursday of November each year shall be designated the annual meeting unless otherwise noted. Elections for officers will occur at this annual meeting. Newly elected officers will take their positions at the December meeting. Um, I can't recall if the old ones say that they take it at the, no, the, that it, it's always been December, I think. Um, but yeah, we, we have elections in November. And then December is kind of like a nice little uh, overlap month to take it over. So you're, and and then uh, if they're giving a, a treasurer is giving a, a annual report in January, you know, gives them a month to get caught up and talk with the old treasurer and all that fun stuff. Uh, does anyone have any questions about this? I, uh, Adam, I'd like to put this one back in discussion because sure. I think it really does make it seem like the next month, you know, we're we're out of here, and the next people. Uh, I'd like for us to consider making it January and having this transition month. You know, who the new people are coming. You work jointly in December, and then hand it over in January. So, all right. I well, yep. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's up for vote. All right. The or for discussion. The nomination D. The nomination process for officers will be announced at the September, October, and November meetings. People may nominate anyone who would like to serve the community chosen from voting members as defined when we said, hey, here's what a voting member is. Does anyone have any questions? Desire to discuss? All right, I'm not gonna get through all of them, but here's the last one I'm gonna do. 
Uh, e, the chairs or any executive officer may call special meetings provided that a majority of the officers agree to the need for a special meeting. A simple majority of the membership who have expressed interest in Fairhaven may submit a request for a special meeting. This request must be made in writing to the recording secretary, either to hand her a letter or uh, email and approved by a majority of the officers. Uh, this isn't changed except for adding the email address. Does anyone have any questions? and desire to discuss or negotiate or anything. All right, I'll consider that one passed. I'll consider the rest of the bylaws on hold till next month. Um, and I'll remain the seed by the rest of the five minutes to the anyone who wants it. Thank you so much, Adam. All right, and quickly, um, not sure if I have any quick announcements at all that needed to be. Uh, I just want to alert people that if you see me walking around next Tuesday with a group of people on Grand Avenue, we have a group of Southern Connecticut State University School of Business professors coming to to walk on Grand to meet some of the owners of the businesses and to figure out how the business school might support our business community. Uh, the same is true, actually, the day before on Monday with some doctors in the morning. So you see me walking around with the group. We want to say hello. In the Monday morning, they're doctors. Tuesday afternoon, they're um, they uh, people from the business school. And then I just want to remind people, Riverfest is on June 3rd, so after Fairhaven Day. I, uh, I just want to remind everybody that Fairhaven Day is one month from today. And so I have flyers here. And you're welcome to take some or her. You have one. Okay, if anybody wants to take her down the way out. Um, and there, if you want to take some to bring to businesses, whatever, post in the neighborhood, um, you're very welcome to do so. We're really excited. This brings together a lot of different efforts. Um, it's going to be really, really great. We're doing the Merry Way Parade now merged with Fair Haven Day. So the parade is going to start at Times Square Park and make its way to Fair Haven School. We're going to have this whole parking lot shut down with activities and music and everything all day. Then at, at 6 30, there's going to be a performance of Romeo and Juliet by mm -hmm. Ice the Beat inside the Auditorium School with high school students and young college students. Mm -hmm. It's going to be really, really great. So I just thank you for all the support. Abby uh, George represents this, the CMT on the committee and just want to make sure that everybody knows about it, we the word out, so it's on Facebook, it's on all the places, so please just tell everybody, spread the flyer, et cetera, and come. Thank you so much, Alder Miller, and really, really quickly, apart from Alder Miller, I have not seen either in the library or online, um, Alder Ellen Cooper, Claudia Herrera, Alder Fedstaff, Ernie, Alder Ernie Santiago, nor Alder Jose Crespo for their Alder report. Uh, so if, you, yeah. if you'd like to uh, reach out to them and let them invite them into the meeting so they can share with us next month, that would be awesome. Thank you so much, everyone, and have a great evening. We'll see you next month. We are adjourned. All right. Thank you, everyone, uh, that joined us and stuck around with us tonight. Uh, the library gets booted out promptly at eight. So, <laughs> uh, but I will catch everyone next month. All right. Bye.